Is it part of the human condition to dream of living in a better world? In a utopia? Ever since Thomas More coined the term, the idea of utopia has captivated us. It's been reimagined and reinvented by generations of writers and artists and dreamers, each interpreting it in their own distinctive ways. But why has this vision of a place somewhere between fiction and reality exerted such a hold over us? Utopian dreams have driven popular culture and high art. From Swift to Star Trek, Wagner to Wikipedia, utopias have broadened the horizons of the human imagination, inspiring extraordinary architecture. Look at this. Whole new genres of fiction and radical experimental communities. We're a deviant culture. We change the relationship that the people have with material goods. In this program, I'm going to find out how utopias start as aspiration, as blueprints for fairer worlds. Could you guys come up with some rules about your own perfect worlds? I'll explore the values that utopian visions have in common and whether they can inspire real change. If you can improve the world for the most marginalized population, it can get better for all of us. By finding out what you can do, it's the only way you can be the best person you can be. I want to ask what our utopian visions reveal about humanity's deepest hopes and fears. Remember this? It seems like an age ago now, doesn't it? A kind of warning that the route towards a better world is rarely smooth. This is our time to restore prosperity and promote the cause of peace and reaffirm that while we breathe, we hope. And where we are met with cynicism and doubt and those who tell us that we can't, we will respond with that timeless creed that sums up the spirit of a people. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. We all want to believe in a better world, in a utopia. The big puzzle, of course, and it's baffled humanity at least since Plato, is how do we get there? Let's start with perhaps the most basic utopia of all, a moment of liberation from the humdrum of everyday life. Where better to begin than at a football match? Here, tens of thousands of people come together to share in a common passion and a dream. If there's one person who understands this utopia, it's veteran commentator John Motson. I think for many, many people it was always a release because when football crowds were huge just after the Second World War, many people worked not just Monday to Friday, but the men would also work Saturday morning. And when they left their jobs at lunchtime on Saturday, they would make straight for the football stadium. And that was their release at the end of a very gruelling and maybe boring working week. There was a utopian feel about it because this was their moment when they could let off steam or cheer or boo or support their local club. I love those Lowry paintings of the football grounds and everyone processing in yeah. as a direct equivalent of the factory. And, of course, going to the match is one of them, isn't it? It conveys them descending on a football ground. The factory worker and the managers 
are all in the same place and they're all cheering for the same thing. That's right. And that's quite amazing in terms of bringing a community back together. Yeah, and I think, I think that's where this feeling of belonging for a football fan is, is really essential to why he's going. Because once he gets inside the ground, he is irrevocably linked to the performance of those players and to the brains of that manager. You know, suddenly they're, they're at one. They all want success, and if it's failure, they all go through that as well, together. Football says something to me about the resilience of humans and their ability to keep on hoping yes. yeah. and keep on dreaming. Absolutely. Clubs have their good runs and their bad runs, and the supporters live through the bad runs, hoping that the good run is going to come very soon. I always remember reading uh, Alan Silito's book, Saturday Night and Sunday oh, Morning. Oh, yeah, wonderful. And the, uh, sort of the anti-hero of that, where he said, this chapter started, he always knew Notts were going to lose, because the guy was Notts County fan, but he was so pessimistic when he went to the game. So, and, I mean, that makes another point. Football isn't all about, you know, standing there and yelling. I mean, it, there, there is a sort of a, a sentimental, cultural side to the way people follow the game. John Motson's right. Football is about so much more than football. I think it speaks to a deeper yearning. This shared hope for better, week in, week out, come what may. It seems to me that hope, that optimism, is something that runs as a current all the way through human history. The kind of hope for better that we see in football fans was given philosophical gravitas by the Tudor polymath, Thomas More. More set out a blueprint for a better world, an imaginary, idealized society with a name which started as a knowing classical joke. Literally, in Latinized Greek, utopia means no place. It's a place that can't exist, or a place that doesn't exist. But when Thomas More published the book in 1516, he included a poem in which he spelt the word differently, etopia, which means a good place. And it's that inherent ambiguity that means that Utopia has been contested for centuries. Moore's own dream of utopia was of a faraway land. His book is presented as a mariner's tale. It was written in an era of feverish excitement, as a new and perhaps better world was being charted across the seas. In Bristol, tourists take a spin in a replica of the Matthew, the small ship in which John Cabot sailed across the Atlantic in 1497 and reached North America. During the age of exploration, there were ships like this traveling all over the world, packed with hardy souls, desperate to find new knowledge, new understanding, who knows, new lands. To me, the sea was like the internet of its age. Little packets of information traveling backwards and forwards, crisscrossing the globe. And those sailors who were coming into ports were coming with pretty tall tales of lands far away that were verging on perfect. The promise of a utopia, of a better place, of a good place, always seem to be just over the horizon. Thomas More's utopia was partly inspired by Amerigo Vespucci's reports of his encounters with the natives of South America, innocent and uncorrupted by the European love of gold. The natives of More's utopia have democracy, religious tolerance, and no private property. What's fascinating, I think, is that Moore puts forward a version of communism several centuries before Marx and Lenin. He writes, Nobody owns anything, but everyone is rich. 
For what greater wealth can there be than cheerfulness, peace of mind, and freedom from anxiety? It's a very romantic idea that back in the golden age of exploration, people weren't just looking for trade routes and new resources, but they were also looking for the answers to kind of all the big questions in life, you know, and, the, and to, therefore to utopia. Um, there's amazing stories and tales about people searching for Shangri-La and Eden. And um, I think today we're still the same. We might, we might have mapped the planet, but there's still so much to see and experience for ourselves. Explorer Belinda Kirk has tracked camels through China's desert of death, uncovered ancient rock paintings in Lesotho, and rode unsupported right around Britain. She believes that seeking out new and better worlds is more than just a choice. It's an innate urge. There's a lot of studies about the explorer gene, which has been identified as 7R, which is also known as the wanderlust gene. So this idea that um, a fifth of the population have this real strong feeling to explore. Now, that exploration might be um, physically looking for new lands, or it might be that they are, um, are philosophers. You know, they have got new ideas, and, and they're the people who break those boundaries. Do you think that there's, you know, something utopian inherently about all exploration? I think it's the characteristic that is in largely is the reason for our development and evolution. The groups that are innovative, that are exploring, they're going to come up with the solutions. And I think that's what you need, isn't it, for any utopia. You need progress. And people being engaged, people being excited. But there's that hope that this could be the trip that is really enriching. Is that what keeps you going back? I think at the time you don't always think that. There's a lot of type two fun in exploration. I don't know if you've heard of that. No, what's type one? So type one is fun at the time and fun afterwards. Type two is not fun at the time, but fun afterwards. And type three is not fun at any time. <laughs> so a lot of what happens on expeditions is you suffer a bit, but you learn that through suffering, you can achieve things that you wouldn't otherwise achieve. And then I think you take that into the rest of your life. It does sound a little bit utopian, this idea that you can discover a better place that doesn't have to be an actual place. It can be a, a better place for yourself. By finding out what you can do, it's the only way you can be the best person you can be. Perhaps we don't all have the explorer gene. But that doesn't mean we can't go on a voyage to discover utopia vicariously. The exploits of the Age of Exploration spurred writers to imagine new and ever more exotic worlds. One 18th century author's story of an explorer enduring a lot of type two fun has become one of the most influential works of literature ever written and it would ultimately inspire utopian change in the real world. I slept sounder than I ever remember having done in my life. For when I awakened, it was just daylight. I attempted to rise, but I wasn't able to stir. I found that my arms and my legs were strongly fastened on each side to the ground. In a little time, I felt something alive moving on my left leg. Bending my eyes downwards, I perceived there to be a human creature, not six inches tall. In the meantime, I felt at least 40 more of the same kind following the first. I was in the utmost astonishment, and I roared loud and then they all ran away in fright. Where were we? In Lilliput. Exactly. What's the special thing about Lilliput? Yep, I thought... Everyone was very small and then, like, the trees are, like, that big. At Seven Stories, the National Centre for Children's Literature in Newcastle, a little utopia in itself, 
Matthew Gremby's running a workshop for local school children, exploring Jonathan Swift's work and our love of fantastical worlds. Can you think of any books that you've, you've read where there are other made-up lands? Harry Potter. Oh, Harry Potter, Hogwarts. interesting. Hogwarts, that doesn't exist? No. You sure? Yeah. Yeah, anywhere Alice else? Alice in Wonderland? Alice in Wonderland, so Wonderland, that doesn't exist either. One thing that we thought we'd ask you to do is make up a place which is different from your normal life. And I'm just interested to see how it would actually look. So it's always sunny in this world, is it? Yeah. Uh -huh. That's what makes the trees grow so well. Yeah. It turns them happy. There's no cars, you just got to walk everywhere. Ah, what's this here? It's a town on a flower. A town on a flower? Mm -hmm. Wow. So all the celebrities live on the petals. Right, and who lives in the middle? Just normal people. So is it better to be a celebrity or a normal person? Um, some celebrity. While Thomas More wrote Utopia for a narrow audience, the erudite Tudor ruling class. What made Gulliver's travel so enduring is that Swift aimed it at a much broader readership, empowering them to dream. He is doing something really remarkable with it. He is making it a much more approachable kind of utopia than there has been before. He's putting in these little people, the Lilliputians, he's putting in the big people, all of the strange fantasy inventions, which give it a new kind of life, I think, and make it available for a, a much bigger audience. So as soon as Gulliver's Travels comes out, everybody's reading it, whether they're aristocrats at court or, we're told, children in schools. It's obviously written by a man who has an agenda. What are his politics? By the stage, Swift has been on a bit of a political journey, and he's now a Tory, not in the modern sense of Tory, maybe. He's someone who has a, a real sympathy for those who are left out of power. To me, it's a defining element of utopian fiction that it has an agenda. Jonathan Swift made his principles clear in the preface to his story, where he claimed that the bulk of the people were forced to live miserably by laboring every day for small wages to make a few live plentifully. In utopias, there are often a lot of rules to make sure that everybody behaves in, in the right way so that the whole society functions really well. So could you guys come up with some rules about your own perfect worlds? With his idea of escaping into extraordinary worlds, Jonathan Swift arguably invented children's literature. And, just as importantly, he put utopian dreams into the heart of it. Some of the very first children's books that are published in the 1740s and the 1750s, so just a, a couple of decades after Gulliver's Travels, they pick up on this idea of big and small, which is embodied in the word Lilliput. And you have the Lilliputian magazine, the first magazine written for children, 1751 to 52, which has taken that word from Swift. It's a really interesting publication. It has poetry in it, it has riddles, it has all sorts of uh, miscellaneous contents, including, and this is what I find so fascinating, three or four utopian stories, little travel narratives, which are rather like what's happened in Gulliver's Travels, and which uh, are going to take these young readers to some really extraordinary places, governed by extraordinary rules. In your perfect world, are there any rules that people have to obey? Yeah, um, don't argue, discuss. And if you're sad, be happy. But what about this one I can see there? No one's allowed not to like football. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone tries to be more important than other people. They, they're not allowed to be more important than everyone's equal. The Lilliputian magazine's utopian stories are each about how a child takes over an island kingdom and rules it according to their own edicts to make it a better place. One of them was the history of the Macaulians, uh, about a, a little boy who manages to save a corrupt society by leading his people to a new island and putting in his own rules to make it a much more virtuous country. And the remarkable thing about that is that in this new country, there's a radical redistribution of property. All inhabitants every four years are to bring their money into the public treasury, from which an equal distribution was made again. That sounds a bit like some of your ideas about everybody being equal, don't you think? Yeah. Stories like this in the Lilliputian magazine had real impact, seeding revolutionary ideas among a new generation of thinkers living at a time of intellectual and political ferment. 
In the late 18th century, the shock of the French Revolution reverberated through Britain's stratified society. This was a time when industrialization was creating dark satanic mills, and William Blake dreamed of a spiritual utopia, a Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. One young reader of the Lilliputian magazine, perhaps more influenced by its writings than any other, was Thomas Spence. This radical political firebrand was born into a poor family in Newcastle. He had 18 brothers and sisters. And he actually lifted whole sections of the Lilliputian magazine and used them directly in his own radical political writings. For Spence, the route to utopia on Earth lay, perhaps unsurprisingly for a kid from such a big family, in gathering resources and sharing them. For him, it was all about commonsing. The concept of the commons, the ideal of shared ownership by a community, is, I think, a vital but often overlooked strand of utopian thought. We take it for granted today, but common land, like much public space, has had to be fought for tooth and nail. This is Newcastle's Town Moor, 1,000 acres of rural space slam in the middle of urban Newcastle. It might look peaceful nowadays, but in 1771, this was the battleground that fired Thomas Spencer's utopian politics. When landowners threatened to enclose the moor, Spence rallied the local freemen to campaign for common ownership of the land. The freemen wished to see the people of Newcastle enjoy sole and several grazing rights in perpetuity by able to lead their animals up the hill and onto the moor for the summer season. Spence clearly did ignite the debate, was provocative, and he did generate the thinking behind a common. And they actually succeeded. It took a week in Parliament, and they came back with the Town War Act, 1774. Uh, they were hailed as heroes, um, and uh, it's led to where we are today. But today, a quarter of a millennium later, and there are still cows being grazed on the moor by freemen. I mean, that's quite a victory. It's, it's tremendous, but it, it, it is part of the culture in this city. Uh, the town moor is the prized assets. It, it's the city loan. After helping to create a little utopia in Newcastle, Spence scaled up his campaign, thumbing his nose at the grandest landowner in Britain, His Majesty King George III himself. Hark how the trumpets sound Proclaims the land around the jubilee Tell all the poor oppressed No more they shall be sensed no That's Thomas Spencer's alternative national anthem. In his championing of the poor, Spence dreamed of commonsing not just land, but education and money. This is a really, really important historical object. It's 1797 cartwheel penny. And with this object, Spence saw an incredible opportunity to get his message, his utopian vision, out to the masses. 200 million of these were issued in the 1790s by the Crown. First time Britons owned an identical image of Britannia and, of course, of King George. So what Spence did was he took them and he counter-stamped them with his message. It read, No landlords, you fools. Spencer's plan forever. He sent thousands of these coins back into circulation. His plan was utterly visionary, 
and for having it, conceiving of it, he found himself repeatedly in prison and repeatedly he defended the principles he dedicated his life to. The king thought he'd issued a propagandist message to the people. Spence took it and issued a utopian vision to the people. Thomas Spence died in 1814 in the same poverty into which he'd been born. If he was alive today, I like to imagine that he'd be a digital rights campaigner. Because in cyberspace, his idea of the commons remains a powerful, if contested, concept. Here, the commons is no longer about shared land, of course, but about shared ideas. I'm going to try to explain how it is that the internet takes Thomas Spence's thinking about the commons onto a whole new level. In the words of George Bernard Shaw, that great Irish playwright, you can think of it like this. If I've got an apple and you've got an apple and we exchange our apples, we both end up with one apple. But if I have an idea and you have an idea and we exchange ideas, we both end up with two ideas. The concept of a commons of ideas and knowledge on the internet is championed today by Wikipedia. In Berlin, hundreds of Wikipedia editors from across the world are holding a convention. I think of this as a kind of UN of knowledge. They're sharing ideas and bravely fighting for free speech in their time, just as Spence did in his. I think my contribution to Wikipedia is a way to disseminate more freedom and democracy for more people in my country and in the world, maybe. We share the same beliefs, we share the same goals. If I would describe it in words, it's like a, a second life. It's really just thousands of people trying to get things right so that what's being presented on Wikipedia is the truth. The crowd made online encyclopedia is nothing if not ambitious in its utopian dream for every human to freely share in the sum of all knowledge. With 18 billion visits every month, 40 million articles in almost 300 languages, and around 120,000 regular volunteer editors, Wikipedia is arguably one of humanity's greatest collective efforts. So. Are you ready to edit? I'm ready. You're ready. So you're going to click the edit. Executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation, Catherine Ma, is helping me to become a Wikipedian. I'm going to go for something I know a bit about. The French Revolution. I was hoping there might be missing references, but I'm seeing... There are some missing references in this section. That looks like something that we could do. I want the Mission Impossible music. Oh, what have I done? I've made a shambles of this. Uh, <laughs> I really have made a shambles of this. You see, we'll be able to uh, there's an important this. lesson here, which is concentrate. <laughs> here we have a commons. But is this commons a virtual utopia? Is it really as smooth-running, democratic and idealistic as it appears to be? In practice, it would seem impossible for such a model to work. That you could ask people to write some sort of common sense of knowledge, come to consensus on difficult issues, and that it, anybody could edit it, right? And that wouldn't fall prey to sort of vandalism or other problems. But the reality is that Wikipedia works, and it works remarkably well, and it works in 300 different languages with all of these people from all over the globe. So I think there is something in there that is about sort of an optimism and a generosity of spirit that speaks to our better nature. Are there any topics that you could imagine that would n not be worthy of coverage? Oh, Wikipedians decide that sort of thing every single day. Wikipedians determine what's notable and what's not. And it's not necessarily the same thing as what's famous and what's not. You could have notable things in Wikipedia that no one, that only five people have ever heard of, but it's important in some way to human knowledge. And then you could have things that are essentially ephemera, that are here today and gone tomorrow. 
is that in any way pointing towards the sort of tension within the organisation between those who want to include more? Yes, we and... actually call them inclusionists and deletionists. Okay. And there is a strong tendency. Most Wikipedians have a tendency one way or another. I'm an inclusionist. I believe that the more things that we have that are available for people to learn from, the more we represent sort of the truth of the world around us. I can kind of imagine Wikipedia as being a utopian community, mm -hmm. which is to say it has no physical place, but it's definitely part of a drive to make the world better. I think there's a utopian aspect to what we believe, that free knowledge should be available for all, that everyone should be able to participate in it, not just consume it, and that we should reach every single person on the planet. What really strikes me about Catherine Marr's vision for Wikipedia is the notion of equal access and equal rights for everyone on the planet. In other words, equality. Alongside the commons, the ideal of equality is a vital pillar of much utopian thinking. People often assume that equality is something humanity has come up with rather recently. But in fact, the struggle for equality takes us deeper still into utopian dreams. Let us make this conference the beginning of a stage in our quest for making democracy the thing it should be and should have been 200 years ago. This is the time that we will make women and men share equally. Thank you very, very much. Imagined worlds where different peoples and sexes enjoy equal rights have a long and rich history. In 1405, a century before Thomas More, and more than 500 years before Germaine Greer is the female eunuch, Christine de Pizan wrote the book of the City of Ladies. De Pizan extolled women's accomplishments. Her allegorical city is a refuge from patriarchy and male dominance, populated, she writes, by all women who have loved and do love and will love virtue and morality. From the City of Ladies to the City of Angels. In Los Angeles, the home of Hollywood's dream factory, which has pushed out countless visions of alternative, better worlds, there's a project that fits squarely into the feminist utopian tradition. This is a rehearsal of a play that continues the fight for gender equality by exploring how pregnant women are marginalized. Bumps is a play that's written specifically for a cast of three pregnant actors at three different stages of pregnancy. The piece is a way to create a small economy for pregnant performers in the absence of one. It felt really good for me. It's very moving to watch you guys work together because I feel like... Playwright Rachel Cowden Nailbuff's avant-garde play is about more than giving an opportunity to pregnant actors. It's also a provocative feminist critique of why that opportunity doesn't usually exist. The hope is that watching pregnant actors on stage makes everyone start to wonder, why have I never seen this before? And not just in the theater, but what else is broken about our current world that I'm now suddenly realizing is broken because I've just assumed that pregnant women are invisible and don't participate in society. Almost everything I know, I've taught myself. Yeah, discover it. How to walk down the street. How to bleed. There's a bell hooks quote that I really love, which is that um, art should do more than show us the world as is. It should show us what the world could be. And so something that I really love about utopian art is that it acknowledges the reality. You know, it's not dreamy, la-la, oblivious to what's going on because by creating a solution um, or an experimental solution, you're also reflecting on something you're dissatisfied with. I just want someone in my life, you know? And this feels so different from needing. 
Why do you think there's a really urgent need to be thinking about and talking about feminist utopias now? The feminist approach to utopia is really crucial because what it does is it rejects the idea that utopia is the product of one man's genius or anybody's genius and that actually utopia requires a multiplicity of minds. And the theater to me is the natural place to explore utopian thinking in a feminist way because it's so collaborative. Let's play, let's play through again. And um, yeah. what if you use more space yeah. within the space? And you can also allow yourself to- It's about realizing the patriarchy is limiting for all of us. It traps everyone and that if you have fair pay, if you have affordable childcare, if you have sane labor practices. These are things that make the world a better place for everybody. If you can improve the world for the most marginalized population, it's a key to how it can get better for all of us. The more I explore it, the more I'm struck by how disruptive utopian art like the bumps can be helping us re-engage with the problems of the real world, giving us a glimpse of a way towards a better future. Must be those strangers that come this has never been more so than in the 1960s, a time of utopian optimism, perhaps like no other. Alongside experiments with values and chemical stimulants, the 1960s was also the moment when explorers started to look for utopia, not on the other side of the world, but in space. Hey, Mr. Spaceman, won't you please take me along? I won't do anything wrong. Hey, the exploration of space is one of the great adventures of all time. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Space exploration launched a new wave of utopian storytelling. Nowhere more powerfully than via the new medium of television. Setting their stories in space, television writers could smuggle daring and subversive futures under the radar and see them broadcast into millions of living rooms. One series in particular was hugely influential in tackling the issue of racial equality. This one I like the most. They caught the essence of who I am in this picture, Lieutenant Uhura. <laughs> These are original publicity shots? Yes. Michelle Nichols played Lieutenant Uhura in Star Trek. Her role on the bridge of the USS Enterprise, inherently utopian, as she sought to communicate in hundreds of alien languages. A signal, Captain. It's very weak. It's Balak. It's a distress signal to the Fasarius. We might smile today at the cardboard sets and primitive oh. special effects, but in Star Trek, we see a coming together of so many utopian elements. Any reply? Negative, his signal is growing weak. Sir, I doubt if the mothership could have heard it. What's intriguing is that it's an escapist entertainment, like Gulliver's Travels. There's a crew in which men and women are equal, and they strive for peace in a galactic commons. This is the captain speaking. First Federation vessel is in distress. We're preparing to board it. There are lives at stake, by our standards, alien life, but lives nevertheless. Captain out. This was also an imagined utopia that set out to change reality. Star Trek's creator, Gene Roddenberry, was making a statement on the struggle for civil rights in America by writing a black officer onto the bridge of the Enterprise. He was one of the most brilliant men on the planet. And if somebody came up and said, that doesn't make sense, he'd hold a conference with them. And he said, that comes from your limited point of view. I'm talking about the big picture. What were his ideals like? In a word, we are one. Your performances are so strong, partly because you really feel the message exactly. that Gene Roddenberry's 
Sure. A absolutely. Because we were doing something that we really believed in, and you had something to hold on to, to, to hold up. This is where I'm coming from. <laughs> in an episode called Plato's Stepchildren, the series boldly went where American television right. had so far feared to go with the first interracial kiss on screen. I'm so frightened, Captain. I'm so very frightened. That's the way they want you to feel. Makes them think that they're alive. Kirk and Ahura's dialogue, ostensibly about telekinetic aliens, can be interpreted as a commentary on white supremacists. Kirk, as I recall, he's like, you know, <laughs> like this. And he said, I told you I'd get you sooner or later. <laughs> Did you realize when you shot that kiss how long it would be remembered for? <laughs> this enormously important historical oh. TV kiss. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And interracial? Yeah, exactly. And they said, when the kiss went on, it, you know, this was an interracial thing. And I simply said, yeah, because that's what my whole family is. Yeah. They wrote my life. Yeah. <laughs> Michelle considered quitting the show early on because she worried Ahura didn't have enough to do. But she was convinced to continue by Dr. Martin Luther King, who saw the significance of a black female role model being beamed into American living rooms. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream. Do I gather that you recognize me? I recognize what you appear to be. Martin Luther King's utopian dream shines through a Star Trek episode in which the crew beam Abraham Lincoln onto the ship. And there's a telling exchange with Uhura. Excuse me, Captain Kirk. Yes, sir. Mr. Scott. What a charming negress. Oh, forgive me, my dear. I know that in my time, some use that term as a description of property. But why should I object to that term, sir? See, in our century, we've learned not to fear words. May I present our communications officer, Lieutenant Uhura? The foolishness of my century had me apologizing where no offense was given. We've each learned to be delighted with what we are. Dr. King was a man who preached that we should not see differences between races. That's right. And that we should um, love one another. Yes. Do you feel that Dr. King's message was really quite like Star Trek's message? Yes, very much. And uh, that that's why he was a trekker. <laughs> he was, you know, and he made no bones about it. He was so pleased that we were do getting what he meant. Utopian visions like Star Trek act as a beacon. They're crucial in criticizing the present so as to mark the way towards a better future. But there's a flip side to utopian thinking, dystopia. Dystopian literature reminds us that hard-won gains can be lost. Dreams like equality and shared ownership can go out of the window. Dystopias warn us we must beware humanity's darker authoritarian side if we're ever to reach a better place. Just outside Vilnius in Lithuania, I'm being interrogated by the KGB in an immersive and very disorientating theatre experience. They call it 1984 the survival drama after George Orwell's classic dystopian novel about the Big Brother state. This three hour performance set 20 feet underground in a disused nuclear bunker distills the Soviet experience into a grim, unremitting dystopia. The 
creators, for whom the Soviet experience's recent memory, believe you can't just read about dystopia, you have to feel it. Why do you put people through this? Just to make people understand how living in Soviet Union was like. This experience of working here is very important for me because I love free Lithuania, I love freedom, and I want to show our society that uh, freedom is much more better than than totalitarian system. Orwell's bleak vision of life under a totalitarian state, still a bestseller today, is a recurring metaphor. The book even has a cameo as a prop or rather, a blunt weapon. You imagine George Orwell might have approved, as his sinister interrogator O'Brien warns hero Winston Smith. If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. Astonishingly, it's popular with tourists and school parties who play the role of participant and victim. We have a lot of students from schools, so we call it live history lesson. So three hours, they are here, just facing the Soviet Union, the discipline there, and all the reality. So how do the school kids respond? I mean, it's quite an immersive, a very immersive, and quite a daunting experience. Um, so usually, you know, they come here and they are thinking that this is the game, you know? Like, guys who are 17, 16 years old, they are coming here and just behaving like, what, what, what can you do for me, you know? So it takes about 10 minutes <laughs> and we've, we've got the silence there, you know? And they are kind of scared. Perhaps they walk out realizing quite how lucky they are to have been born when they were born. Yes, yes, they, they go out usually through this door and, and they're shouting freedom, you know, <laughs> and just like going out of the jail. Spread your hands. Spread your fingers. Close your eyes. It might seem extreme, but the 1984 experience is hardly outlandish in our culture. Where George Orwell led, others have followed. In the 18th century, young people read the utopian stories of the Lilliputian magazine. Now it's dystopian comics that help them understand their world. The 1990s cult Marvel series Transmetropolitan is a classic example. It imagined a near future of information overload in which truth is lost in a morally bankrupt society, binging on a diet of sex and violence. Transmetropolitan, the whole hook was when truth is lies, who do you look to, to to bring you what's actually happening? Who's your guide through that world? A journalist. Transmetropolitan's author, Warren Ellis, is one of Britain's most prolific comic book and sci-fi writers. For him, the warning about a dark authoritarian future is about helping his generally young readership to navigate issues of politics and control. Reading dystopic fiction in comics can give kids tools to understand how the way the world is run and letting them know that they're not alone in their lack of understanding and general horror at the way the world is. So there's this one passage um, that I just think is really staggeringly prescient. So he's broadcasting to the city. Mm. Your boss does what he likes. The papers and feed sites that lie to you for the hell of it, they do what they like. And what do you do? You pay them. You must like it when people in authority they never earned lie to you. These things are always true in dystopian fiction. Unearned privilege. One of the many little shocks that Winston Smith gets in 1984 is discovering that O'Brien can turn off the telescreens. Sudden unearned secret privilege. Um, the 0.1% were present in 1984, just as they're present today. You see, I was wondering about this work in relation to 1984, of a world where the truth gets lost and you don't bother to question it or challenge it. This is why 1984 was such an important book, because it was only two steps away from life at a time. It was Anthony Burgess 
who actually revealed that at one time the working title for 1984 was 1948. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was really very, very close to the way Orwell saw the word at the time. 1984 is one of those books that every generation can find a reflection in. We'll act to prevent that or something like that happening. I agree with Warren Ellis. I think of dystopian stories as the warning lights of our time. And it's striking how those warning lights are flashing everywhere these days. There are favorite big budget movie franchises and glossy box set dramas. From a sadistic regime forcing teen gladiators to fight to the death in the Hunger Games. If I'm gonna die, I wanna still be me. I just can't afford to think like that. To a Christian fundamentalist state where the few remaining fertile women are subject to ritualized rape to bear children for their male masters in The Handmaid's Tale. You girls will serve the leaders and their barren wives. You will bear children for them. Today's utopian fiction pits a heroic protagonist against a world that's inhumane, full of torture and brutality. It asks us how do we hold on to our values in this kind of a space? Whereas in the 1960s, such literature and filmmaking was optimistic. Nowadays, it's full of profound fear. For me, there can be no bigger fear than the horror of Nazism. Continuing to haunt us, the Nazi nightmare has been reworked again in the drama The Man in the High Castle, which asks us not to assume our future is set. For surprising you with Ogre's group of yeah. Amazon's adaptation of Philip K. Dick's sci fi novel imagines a 1960s America yes. carved up by Germany and Japan, which yes. in this counterfactual world have won World that. War II. But it was Heydrich who gave the order, he was following orders. Probably don't even know why he wanted me and Louts out of the way. No, sir, I, I don't. I didn't think so. This balcony really reminds me of the scene where the Obergruppenfuhrer throws his adjutant over the edge. That's a horrifying <laughs> moment. Frank Spotnitz developed and produced the series. Why does he think dystopias are so popular today? My feeling is that we're living in a period of heightened fear. Uh, really since 9-11, um, people are very fearful. And dystopian storytelling allows them to work through those fears in a safe space, in an entertaining space. Do you think that dystopian fiction and filmmaking is almost, it's almost cathartic then? I do think in my small way, I try to tell stories that help us think about ourselves, that make us think about ourselves. And Man in the High Castle, I think, is a, is a story that really invites you to look at yourself. It's really more about us than about Nazis. And that's why, especially in the first season, there were hardly any Nazis with German accents. They were all American Nazis. What I was trying to say was, look, you have this in you too. Joe! Sieg ha. Sieg ha. Glad you could make it. Saw you in the parade on TV. It's really something. Oh, yes, it was. Hey, Harry. Sing Heil. Sing Heil. The Victory in America Day celebration at the Smith household. Sing Heil. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Look, that was like Americana. That was like Thanksgiving and, and you know, saying hello to the neighbor. And it, it was pretty nice. And, and, you know, John Smith has a really lovely wife and children. Oh, Joe, this is Thomas and Amy and Jennifer. Hi, uh, guys. Say hi. Say hi. I think you've got to admit that attraction to parts of it. You could argue that National Socialism was a utopian movement. In their mind, they thought they were perfecting man. In my mind, that's what makes it evil. Hitler's vision of utopia 
was of a genetically pure master race, dominating Europe for a thousand years. Please, uh, take a seat. One storyline in The Man in the High Castle interrogates this utopia by confronting its main Nazi protagonist with a terrible personal dilemma. This, um, this won't be easy for you to hear. Your son has a serious disease. Landuzzi de Geron syndrome. He discovers his son has a rare degenerative disease and must, according to Nazi protocols, be euthanized. That's, that's, that's nonsense. My son is the picture of health. I'm afraid he isn't. Within months, uh, perhaps a year, there will be paralysis. That's the mistake, doctor. You're making a mistake. I would never tell you this were I not certain. The look on his face of realization as he suddenly comes to wrestle with the inner human emotional life that he's supposed to entirely suppress in the name of the regime is really striking. That character, played brilliantly by Rufus Sewell, was an attempt by me to say there can be good people who embrace evil ideologies, that that, that actually happens all the time. And that storyline of confronting the terminal illness of his own son, to me, was a perfect way to force him to face uh, the evil of the ideology he'd embraced. As for uh, medical assistance, a syringe and an ampule of an effective combination, absolutely painless. A good dystopian drama is a warning. It's a critique of who we are now, saying these are the impulses that, that we are exercising. This is who we, we will become unless we change path. Frank Spotnitz is right, I think. The dystopian stories are there to keep us on the righteous path, in check, on the way towards a better future. That future might seem uncertain in the current climate of fear, but it's within our seemingly undaunted search for utopia that I find some optimism. Utopias spur the human imagination and keep us asking the big questions, whether as dreams of escape and exploration, as campaigns or as warnings. What links these very different visions, it seems to me, is our almost innate drive to make the world a better place. We imagine utopias through fiction, I think, because they encourage us. They speak to the good in us and around us of utopian acts of everyday life and of extraordinary kindness. If someone falls in the street, just watch as others rush up to help. If we're attacked by terrorists, witness our resilience. Our desires for utopias is, I think, an important part of the human condition. The thing that inspires us to keep trying to improve our world. In the next episode, from imagination to implementation. <laughs> Radical communities. Hi, can I join you? Utopian ideologies grand architectural visions. We are declaring war on the slums. But is humanity ever really up to the job? <laughs> <laughs>